Well, we have the privilege of having several people here that know a lot about the Tarrant, Tarrant Regional Water District Integrated Pipeline Project, specifically about the zebra mussels. And I'm sure if you haven't heard about it, we're, we're going to hear a lot about it today and what's going on with that and how we plan for that. Um, we have Mrs. Shelley Hatton. She is from the University of Texas at Arlington, and that's where she got her bachelor's and her master's degrees. She also is a PE with 20 years of experience in the area. She's been, a, she's a project manager with the Tarrant Regional Water District, and she's mainly working on the Integrated Pipeline Project. And if you haven't heard about the IPL project, it's $2.3 billion worth of work. So uh, would you please help me welcome Ms. Shelley Hatton to the, to the podium. I'm not sure if it's good morning or good afternoon just yet. It probably is good afternoon, but um, howdy. My name's Shelley Hatton. I'm with the Tarrant Regional Water District. I was the, I am the um, pro project manager for the invasive species study for, for the IPL. But um, before I start getting into all these three-letter acronyms, let me kind of explain some of them. Uh, the background on today's presentation is to just do a brief introduction on what the uh, Integrated Pipeline Project is. If you can stay later for the technical presentation, Kathy Barrick is going to be going into much more detail of what the project is and, and what's coming up for that project as well. Um, I'm going to talk about the progression of zebra mussels into North Texas and uh, look at our water system vulnerabilities. And uh, of course, since we are in the design phase of the IPL, we're going to talk about uh, what, what our control strategies are. And uh, we do have some uh, testing that's ongoing that um, I can share with, some, with you on some of our results. Okay, um, the Integrated Pipeline Project is a joint project between the Dallas Water Utilities and the Tarrant Regional Water District. Dallas Water Utilities was established in 1881, and uh, its mission is to uh, provide water and waste, wa wastewater service. And uh, they have water supplies from six different reservoirs, uh, Louisville, Grapevine, Ray Hubbard, Tawakini, Ray Roberts, and Fork, and they serve uh, they serve 3.8 million people in the Dallas and nearby in the Dallas area and 27 nearby communities, and uh, they're funded solely by water and wastewater rates paid for by customers. On uh, on my side of the uh, the the county line is the Tarrant Regional Water District, and we, we were established in 1924 as a uh, political subdivision, and we only d d deliver raw water. We do not treat any water. And uh, we also provide levy and uh, flood control services. It's real fun to, to stay up till all night to, to do those flood controls, and, but we haven't done that in a long time. Um, we serve, uh, we are located in eight North Texas counties and we serve 1.8 million people. And uh, our funding is through uh, the sale of municipal bonds. Uh, and we have a raw water rate to wholesale customers. And we also ha have um, gas um, uh, royalties on uh, that also help fund us as well. And our main uh, wholesale customers include the city of uh, Fort Worth, the city of Arlington, the city of Mansfield, and the uh, Trinity River Authority. Um, the, the, uh, I'm going to use the pointer here. The, the Tarrant Regional Water Supplies, we, we actually own and operate Lake Bridgeport, uh, Eagle Mountain Lake, Cedar Creek Lake, and Richland Chambers Lake. And uh, we use the uh, we use Bendrick Lake as terminal storage, and we use the, uh, the uh, Lake Arlington as terminal storage as well. And we can also pump water all the way up to Eagle Mountain Lake itself. Uh, about 20 years ago, uh, Dave Marshall and, uh, met with uh, the folks with uh, the city of Dallas, and both of us had uh, water that uh, we needed to get from East Texas located in approximately the same area. Lake Palestine is a, a, um, a Dallas water utility lake, 
and um, well, it's Natchez River Authority Lake, but the water rights are Dallas's. And uh, so there was an opportunity there for us to to uh, share costs. And again, Kathy's going to explain more on, on uh, that later. So that's a little tease. Just stick around. Um, but the integrated pipeline is uh, a $2.3 billion pro project. We will be taking water from um, Lake Palestine, uh, Cedar Creek Lake, and uh, Richland Chambers Lake, and we'll be pumping it up and over to be able to drop this drop off to uh, maybe Joe Pool, but they could be pumped around. But that's where we're going to be delivering uh, the city of Dallas's water. And then we have the ability to be able to tie into our existing system uh, at this location, at uh, this location, and then this location here. So there's three opportunities for us to, to, to bolster our, our, uh, our supplies. Uh, the current studies that are going on, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has a regional zebra mussel study going on with, with uh, various different uh, uh, agencies, and that's being performed by Alan Plummer and Associates. And we have also a consultant with uh, CH2 and Hill doing the IPL invasive species study, and that's really kind of the bulk of what I'm going to talk about today. And then internally, uh, TRWD has, um, has embarked on a hazard analysis and critical control points plan where, we're, uh, where our engineering department is working in conjunction with our operations department to really um, figure out what the, the uh, pieces of equipment that we're most vulnerable to. Okay, this is a zebra mussel. Uh, uh, as you can see, the, 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 this is not life size here. They're, they're, they're very small and they're very prolific uh, and they're very adaptable. But uh, you can see they're zebra mussels because it looks like a zebra. Um, and they recently, uh, and just to talk about the life cycle of a zebra mussel, because you'll, you'll hear some terms, I want to kind of define them. Um, the, the, the adults here will, will um, form the eggs and then basically this will come into what uh, we call villagers, which is uh, the larvae for the, for the uh, um, zebra mussels. And um, once the, the shell has started to, to form for the villagers, then they can settle out and become um, mature and juvenile uh, zebra mussels. So that's that's really a quick and dirty 101 on zebra mussels. Okay, and then here's the, the USGS site has a, a mussel sightings distribution chart. And as you can see, now the red is all zebra mussels and then the green is quaggas. We don't have quaggas coming into, into the Texas area. But it, you the, the history, from what I understand, is there were the uh, the zebra mussels actually came from the Baltic Sea area, and the, we had uh, um, and it was stuck to the to the side of, of one of the boats and went into the, the Great Lakes, and then from the Great Lakes, it's just kind of spread from from there. And of course, the first place here's the uh, chronological order of what happened in Texas. In April 2009, zebra mussels were found in Lake Texoma. In uh, the spring of 2011, we, we as well, we kicked in on, as well as uh, other agencies to do a um, campaign to boaters. And then uh, the, the summer of 2011, zebra mussel DNA was found in Eagle Mountain and, uh, and uh, Lake Ray Hubbard, as well as our Bridgeport Lake. And uh, it's just, doesn't mean that they're there. It doesn't mean that the, the villagers are there. It just means that some form of a, of a zebra mussel was in our lake at, at one time or another. And we have had sightings of zebra mussels uh, stuck to, to boats. Uh, we've got a very active uh, environmental group out, and they've gone and looked at them, and, and they were all dead. And so we, we, have, we do not have any zebra mussels in our system at this time. Uh, in fall of 2011, um, the U.S. Army Corps of Agency, the U Corps of Engineers did the five-agency planning study, which is the one that's being done by 
uh, Alan Plummer, and then um, in September 2012, zebra mussels were found in Lake Ray Roberts, so they're coming. Uh, here's, here's just a graphical representation of uh, where they're actually located. Here's Lake Texoma, here's Lake Ray Roberts. The uh, Sandy Grove Creek feeding into Levon has got uh, zebra mussels, and then Lake Ray Hubbard has, has uh, zebra mussels. Now, the, the, the part of the, the study that Alan Plummer has done is they, they've actually looked at the area lakes and they classified what's a high risk, a moderate risk, and a low risk. And uh, there's definitely a divide here, as you can, you can see, everything from, from here over is, is a high risk, including our, our uh, Richland Chambers uh, Reservoir, and then Cedar Creek is a moderate risk, and then Lake Palestine is a low risk. So e either way, from, from an IPL standpoint, we do feel like we're going to be, um, we have a high chance of, of having uh, zebra mussels in, that we have to deal with for, on the IPL. And then here is a, uh, the actual monitoring sites where, where the uh, USGS has currently to, to make sure, and they go out and, and monitor to, the, uh, to see if, if, if the uh, progression has gotten uh, his, if, if higher. And uh, the water system vulnerabilities, the water treatment plants, of course, are going to be uh, um, vulnerable. You have clear, clear well, water, water wells, your clarifying tanks. Anything with screens, small piping, that type of thing is going to be at risk for any of the uh, water treatment plants. What we, we'd like to know this because we, we do have customer cities and, and we are helping them learn more about uh, this, this threat. And then, uh, of course, we've got, because we have lake, lake uh, pump stations, we, we do have intake structures and screens where we do know that we're going to have some, um, some fouling of, of the screens due to the zebra mussels. And, and these are real pictures. So, I mean, it, the, I, I remember seeing a picture of, uh, I think, the North Texas uh, intake structure. And I think it took just one one season and the whole structure just got completely encrusted with uh, zebra mussels. Um, large and small diameter piping and valves are, are at risk. Dead ends and pipelines are, are at risk and uh, low flow, uh, low velocity conditions are really what the, the zebra mussels uh, thrive with. What they do is they, they, it allows them to be able to attach to whatever it is that they're, they're attaching to and, um, and, and it, then it, because it's low flow, they can, st they can remain attached to the item and then they feed off of the, uh, the water that goes through it or through the pipe. Uh, the uh, transfer to sto storage reservoirs and lakes, we believe the way that uh, we're going to get infested is really through a, through a boat. Um, being being transferred into into our lakes, uh, we, the Texas Park and Wildlife folks have got the zebra mussels hide here campaign, and we do help fund some some of that. And uh, part of the problem with them getting in the lakes is that the uh, they clean up the lakes, which which means that there's not a lot of nutrients there for um, for for the for the plant life, and if the plant life there's not a, not, not a lot of nutrients there for, for uh, it cleans it up. All right, I, I knew this. All right, but basically they, they, they become a filter and they clean up the, the uh, they, they clear, clarify the lakes. And because they clarify the lakes, it makes it difficult for the fish to, to be there. I know the, the fishermen are very concerned with, with zebra mussels in the area. And then, of course, uh, the zebra mussels, as you can see on this slide here, the, uh, the shells will deposit on your, on your beaches and they become a, a, a hazard because they're very razor sharp and people can, can cut themselves. So, it's an, it, so it really does impact the, uh, the recreation part of, of our uh, management of our lakes. The other uh, 
thing that, that really in, impacts us the most is it reduces our hydraulic capacity, which is one of the reasons why we're, we are putting in the IPL to begin with, is to increase our capacity. It will increase our operating costs because we'll have to uh, uh, go down and do a lot of uh, operations and maintenance to be able to clean different, different uh, pieces of equipment. So uh, it's, it's, we know that there's a significant impact that, that we may be seeing here fairly quickly, um, but uh, we, we feel like we're, we're addressing that head on. Um, potential control solutions. Well, there's biological, there's a Zequinox, which is something that you can put into the, the lakes. It's a chemical that can help kill the, the larvae, and it's, uh, it's expensive, and, uh, and, uh, and it's only, only Zequinox is the one that, that's out right now, so uh, we're not really looking at, at that at this time. There's physical, you can do a UV or high temperature can, can uh, help uh, control it. Uh, oxygen deprivation, desiccation, mechanical cleaning, filtration, coatings, materials of construction. Those are all uh, physical items that, you can, that we can use as a potential control solution. Um, and then on the chemical side of it, we can uh, dose with free chlorine or chloramines. Uh, we, there's other oxidants that we could possibly use to, to put in the water, and as well as potassium permanganate. These are all items that we did consider when we did the uh, IPL study. Um, and then non-oxidizing chemicals, we, can, we could put in a copper iron ion generator, a non-oxidizing um, molluscicides, and uh, bio bullets and potash. Uh, these were all items that we looked at. Um, but really what, we, what it came down to, uh, what we decided to use was uh, uh, chloramines as it, to uh, help, help control the, uh, the, the, the um, zebra mussels. And uh, we're looking at, at uh, doing on-site uh, sodium hypochlorite generation at most of our uh, lake pump stations as well as our booster pump stations. We're also looking at uh, boosting that with uh, some bulk uh, sodium hypochlorite uh, deliveries when, when we're at, at very high levels. So there's, it's, a, it's a combination between the two. The reason why we didn't look at chlor we did look at chlorine, but we took that off the table is because we feel that the regulatory uh, conditions, um, the regulatory conditions in, in uh, the next 10 years, which is really where, where, we're, where we're going to be finally operating, will be to where it's going to be very difficult for us to get chlorine gas delivered. We're already experiencing that as well. Um, we can uh, desiccate, which just means you, you, you uh, put the water, you pull the water down and you let it dry out. Uh, this particular uh, picture here, it shows that uh, the left side was coated with, with GE RTV 11 and the other side wasn't and, and you see that the coatings, the, the zebra rustles did not attach. Um, that, so that's one of the uh, control solutions we're looking at using. Um, mechanical cleaning, which is very high intensity uh, personnel uh, oriented, and it, it is very difficult on us because we don't have a large tolerance to, to go down and clean something and then come back up. The only times that we're really able to, to uh, go out of service is really winter time. And it's very difficult in times such as these. This, this past winter, we had planned to go down on both of our pipelines, but because water, because of the uh, water shortage, we actually had, were not able to go down on one of our pipelines. So, uh, so mechanical cleaning always is also a, a presents some challenges as well. Uh, we are looking at materials and coatings. Uh, one of the things that we did on the IPL it, with the IPL study was we did a, a coupon uh, test. We took various different uh, materials and we put them into the the uh, into Lake Texoma, and we looked at uh, which ones would the uh, zebra mussels would attach to, and which ones the zebra mussels wouldn't, and uh, and so. 
that was important to us because that will help us when we're actually specifying items that, that do come into contact with, with the water. Uh, we also have an invasive species aquatic uh, plant uh, issue. The, the uh, Lake Palestine has giant salvinia in it. And um, once we uh, put uh, the, uh, that particular lake online, we, we need to have a floating plant boom to, to, to try and keep the giant salvinia to be transferred up to any of the lakes that we use uh, to, at, for terminal storage. And uh, oh, here's the coupon testing that we talked about with uh, CH2M Hill and Dr. Robert McMahon. And uh, the scope was to deploy coupons in Lake Texoma to monitor zebra mussel activity in the lake, uh, to monitor uh, lake water temperature, uh, monitor zebra mussel accumulation on coupons, and recommend materials for construction. The way that they monitored, if you looked at the uh, lower left uh, corner, this is this is. This is as high tech as, as, it, as it gets. It's a Brillo pad, and this is this is uh, a sil a sil this is the one type of thing that Dr. McMahon figured out. You just stick a Brillo pad in there, and then they then the zebras will actually start settling onto the zebra mussel or onto the uh, onto the uh, Brillo pad. And so, uh, when you, you hear about monitoring, that, that's really what they're doing. Is sticking these, these Brillo pads down in the water and seeing if they, uh, they yield any uh, zebra mussels. Um, this is a close-up look, the one in the middle, to show you what a juvenile mussel actually looks like. And then uh, over on this side, on the uh, right lower right side, that's uh, one of the, the coupons was a, a uh, uh, one of the coatings that we're, we're evaluating. And what we found was if, as you can see in the picture, there's not a lot of zebra mussels that are attaching to the to to the item. But if you get a holiday, you'll get zebra mussel attachment. The uh, ones that are working out pretty well for us um, are copper, copper nickel, uh, the Fuji film coating, and the Jacqueline coating. But again, the the coatings are expensive, and. Uh, and if you again, if you get any scratches in in the paint itself, you're 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 at risk of getting infestation at that point. And I'm going to open the oh, and I brought some zebra mussels, some actual real life zebra mussels, and I'll have them up here in the front if you would like to to come and look at them. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to uh, entertain them. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to use chloramine. Yeah, she asked uh, if we're going to use chloramines is, is our, and that's what we are. Yes, we are going to be using uh, chloramines. She's asked if we've had any studies done for the core means to see if, the, if that could be an issue, and it just so happens we do. If we've got uh, Dr. Kruzik with the uh, University of Texas at Arlington. He's doing um, a d disinfection byproduct study uh, along with uh, uh, also helping us figure out what kind of uh, um, uh, dosages that we could look at. We've looked at the different processes that our customer cities ha have to see if we have any impacts on them as well. So yes, we are, are looking at that. Sure. Yes, sir. What is the typical lifespan of the zebra mussel, and how long does it exist outside of water? I'm not a biologist. I wish I knew. I don't know. <laughs> she can answer. Oh, she can answer it. <laughs> Now 
Uh, actually, um, she, she said that the zebra mussel, can, their lifespan is a year, year and a half, and that uh, they can survive uh, maybe uh, 48 hours outside of the... the, the well, in the north part of the United States, they were not reaching sexual maturity until about three years, but they're reproducing faster here. Dr. McMahon has done some work with that. So, so they... <laughs> <clears throat> They're reproducing faster here in Texas. So I said that they were adapt adaptable little suckers, and they really are. Um, the, the other thing is the reason why we have got, we're going with chloramines and we're going to go to a year-round dosage for the chloramines is because the, the uh, zebra mussels can actually clam up. And no pun intended, but you know. <laughs> And they can, can can remain closed for about 14 days, so um, it, it, that's another reason why we're going to have to go to year-round uh, treatment. There was another question here. Are there any natural predators for the adults or the larva? Are there any natural predators or adults for the larva? I'm going to look at this lady again. <laughs> Basically, they can reproduce so fast, it doesn't matter if they have a predator or not. That's what I'm hearing. Oh, sure. Kind of outside the box, I'm, I'm a traffic engineer. i got nothing to do with water. But have, have they looked at either using sound waves or sonic or any kind of electrical to electrify the pipes? Yeah, that was one of the, the control measures that, they did, that they're, they're looking at and studying. But it does, it, at, this, at this date, it's not really something that we're, we're going to... Um, use because I don't think anyone really uses that right now. So, all right. Any other questions? All right. Well, I just wanted to say thank you very, very much for letting me come and, and talk. And I also wanted to plug Kathy Barrick again. She's going to have a great talk, and she's going to go into a whole lot more detail of of, uh, of, of what's coming up and what we've done. So, I, I really encourage you to stick around for that. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, thank you, Shelley. Well, we really appreciate you informing us on uh, our water system vulnerabilities and the prevention and the solutions that TRWD is looking into. That, that help makes me feel better about our water. Uh, we appreciate you, and we want to give you a gift that reminds you of us. It's an ASCE portfolio. It's weather. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.